Hello, friends, and welcome back to Behind the Bastards. I'm Robert Evans, and this is the show that tells you everything you don't know about the very worst people in all of history. Uh, today, my guest, who I will be, who's coming in cold to this tale and who I'll be reading a story to, is Brody Reed, comedian. Hello. Hey. Esteemed guest, I think. You Esteemed mean to say. guest, yeah. yes, yes. No Esquire, Brody Reed Esquire, yeah. <laughs> which I think means you're the editor for Esquire magazine. Right. I'm yeah. a lawyer, and I'm also the head editor of Esquire magazine. Those are my credits. Yes. And I won't change them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what that means. Uh, now we're doing a little bit different today. Normally we're we're pretty upfront about who the subject of the podcast is, but there's a Ooh. lot of background to get to before we can really properly introduce this guy. Okay. So I'm kind of curious as to when you figure out who we're talking about, mm-hmm. and I. I'll also kind of want it to be a little bit of a surprise for the audience so okay if you're good i'm just going to get into it okay i mean i'm kind of like an amateur private investigator so i might get it real off the bat and i want to ruin your flow or anything but um let's let's try all right, all right. let's do let's, let's let's see how this goes time you on know? the clock <laughs> maybe this will be you know my 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 great disaster but i think but, it'll be fun yeah all right so uh today you know right now 2018 britain is a tiny adorable nation filled with wizards and a conspicuously broad definition of the word pudding it's easy okay i'm gonna guess voldemort (laughs) (laughs) no 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 i'm just i'm just getting it that it's easy for us to forget today considering how docile the british people are that for a while they ruled the entire world yeah Uh, the british empire was the largest empire in human history the mongol empire at its height held about 24 million kilometers in area Mm -hmm. 16% 16% of the world's population, the British Empire was over 35 million kilometers in area and ruled nearly a quarter of the planet's population. Trust me, I did not forget that they colonized everything. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they, well, I think what's most shocking to me when I read about this is that they controlled that huge chunk of the planet with probably the smallest army that any empire has ever had. Mm-hmm. You know, the Roman Empire at its height was about 750,000 regular soldiers. Um, the British Empire at its you know, height before the World War started was about 120,000 British soldiers. They never spent more than about 2.5% of their GDP on defense. Wow. Which and those are regular soldiers or like super serum, like Captain America soldiers? Ah, <laughs> so you have predicted a little bit on? where this is going. Now, these soldiers what? are regular soldiers. They're volunteers, okay. which is different from most. Most militaries in this period are not volunteer permanent standing militaries. So the British are a little bit different okay. there. But they're just normal you know, soldiers. They have machine guns, which certainly helps with the whole colonizing thing. Um, or they have machine guns for a chunk of this. But, um, you know, it does beg the question, when you've only got 120,000 guys, and for mm-hmm. most of the British Empire, they don't have machine guns, how do you hold a quarter of the planet in bondage for 200 years with a whole army that's a little larger than the modern Coast Guard in the United States? Mm. Nukes. <laughs> is that not the correct? No, answer? no. I mean, okay. you you get the locals to oppress themselves. Oh, God. yeah. That's, yeah. That was my second guess. Yeah. So um, Michael Codner, who was the head of military science for the Royal United Services Institute, described the British Empire's military as essentially quote the Royal Navy and a system of indigenous constabularies overseen by a small but professional British army. Okay. Uh, Now, I found that quote in a BBC article from back in 2011. The article also quoted a military historian named Dr. Hugh Davies, who noted that all of British India was controlled by just 30,000 British troops, supervising hundreds of thousands of local Indian soldiers, or sepoys. He was quoted as saying, The empire had to pay for itself, and it had to be profitable. And if you put too much into building up the army, the empire is no longer a profitable enterprise. <laughs> he sounds like the, a rat mogul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what that sentence sounds like. In the his empire def- has to build itself. <laughs> yeah. In his defense, I don't think he's justifying imperialism. I think he's just explaining this was the attitude that yeah. the imperialists had, is we can't spend too much money on the army, otherwise... Yeah, everything is yeah. for profit. Exactly. I understand. Um, and British India was conquered in the first place by a for-profit corporation, the East India Trading Company. The East India Company had a private army of over a quarter of a million men. Wow. Most of those were indigenous soldiers, so, you know, local Indians, people from Burma, whatever. Yeah, that's great. Local mm-hmm. jobs. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Uh, by local. Very, very ethical with our modern... <laughs> He's a job creator, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the East India Company started taking over India in the 1600s, and by 1803, they controlled most of what's now India, Pakistan, and Burma. In 1814, this giant multinational corporation 
declared war on Nepal, which was at that point known as the Kingdom of Gorkha. They fought for two brutal years before the kingdom ceded a third of its territory to the company in exchange for peace. Mm. The British won, but the Gorkhas had put up a really vicious fight, and the East India Company was impressed by their warriors, so they started recruiting these men into their army. At first, these Gurkhas were used to keep the peace in ever-rebellious India, but the Gurkhas quickly proved themselves to be very capable warriors. In 1858, when the Queen formally took control of India away from the company, Gurkhas were integrated into the greater British army. They served as elite shock troops in World War I and II. The British army today still fields battalions of Gurkhas, recruited basically as mercenaries from Nepal and paid far less than their British citizen counterparts. This sounds like Game of Thrones. <laughs> it <laughs> sounds it's, like some unsullied yeah, it, <laughs> nonsense. It's, it's a little bit like that. Now, the British liked the Gurkhas because they were loyal and just incredibly deadly. Uh, they carry these big knives called kukris in there. There's a mm-hmm. lot of, if you go online, you can find threads today where British veterans talk about the stories their NCOs told about Gurkhas. And like there's a mm-hmm. common one where you have to tie your shoes a certain way. Okay. Because the Gurkhas. They'll cut your foot off. Well, no, they, they'll, when they're doing espionage missions uh-huh. in the night, they'll tell who they want to kill by feeling their bootlaces. They could tell. Like in what? World War II, they knew what German bootlaces felt like. And so if an Allied soldier took boots off of a dead German, he might get cut by a Gurkha. Like the, it's a possibly apocryphal story, Jeez but Louise. variants of it are still told today. So they'll kill you if you tied your shoes wrong, essentially. If you tied your shoes like the enemy. Yeah, I, yeah. Heard, I heard that. Yeah. So the Gurkhas were like super soldiers of the British Empire. A little bit of what you were getting at. <laughs> yeah, they sound like sword guys to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the they're knives equally are Equally like, dangerous. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're scary. <laughs> Um, and they weren't the only super soldiers in the British Empire. Um, over their period of time conquering huge chunks of the world, the British encountered a number of warrior peoples. Some of these peoples, like the Gurkhas, had their own well-developed warrior culture already when the British arrived, and okay. the British just exploited it. But in other parts of the world, the process occurred less naturally. Take the tribes of the West Nile region of Africa. Their first contact with more technologically advanced peoples came in the early 1800s, when successive groups of Arab slavers started preying on them. Certain tribes, who were the best fighters, were enslaved by these Arab slavers and used as soldiers to capture other Africans who were then sent off to markets in North Africa and the Middle East. Sad. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bummer. This whole story is going to be kind of a bummer. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> When you're talking colonialism, it's it's never not a heartbreak. <laughs> I mean, when aren't you talking colonialism? If we if, yeah. if we want to get real, <laughs> well, I mean, and that's that's one of the point. Of, like when you start talking about dictators, especially from the 70s, 80s, 90s, you can mm-hmm. trace nearly all of them back to colonialism. And oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's this. That's more or less this story. Um, so by the 1870s, the British had become abolitionists in a big way, uh, perhaps because they felt kind of bad about, you know, the whole Atlantic <laughs> slave trade thing, but more, mostly because it was a way to justify conquering colonies in Africa, saying we're going to stop the Arab mm-hmm. slave traders, but we have to conquer this whole chunk of Africa in order to stop the slave trade. Right. The only way to do it. They're a good guy with a gun. Mm-hmm. With a lot, with all with of a, the guns. With a lot of muskets, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the British took over a huge chunk of North Africa, including the Sudan, and with public pressure behind them, they sent armies down to stop the slave traders. These armies, like all British armies, were made mostly of locals. Many of those locals were recently freed slave soldiers that the British were happy to induct into their army. So they would free these slave soldiers from the Arab slave traders, mm-hmm. and then they would induct them into a colonial military and use them to fight slave traders. Yeah, sounds like college. <laughs> sounds like the job market. <laughs> I thought you were going to compare this to like college football. And I was like, well, well, yeah, that too. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so one such army of former slaves was headed by a German doctor and a Muslim convert named Emin Pasha. In the 1880s, Emin Pasha and his army were besieged by an Islamic army during the Modest Insurrection. They were eventually freed by a guy named Henry Morton Stanley, who regular listeners of the podcast will recognize as the guy who mapped the Congo for King Leopold of Belgium. Stanley took Pasha with him when he left, and Pasha's men stayed behind in the West Nile region on garrison duty for a few years, until they were picked up by agents for the Imperial British East Africa Company. Now, the company representatives were always alert for new warrior people to enlist, and they considered these men to be, quote, the best material for soldiery in Africa. (laughs) These tribes came to be called Nubi, or Nubians, and became the British Empire's shock troopers in Africa. The East Africa Company used their Nubians to carve an empire out of the continent's heart. They named their new colony Uganda. 
As the British Empire grew, the Nubians were inducted into the regular British army and became the elite 4th Battalion of the King's African Rifles. They were Muslims, which differentiated them from most of the peoples they were sent to suppress in Central and West Africa. The British basically turned the Nubian people into a living, breathing factory for the production of the deadliest colonial soldiers in Africa. And yes, being bred for war had a negative impact on the Nubians themselves. Here's what one former commanding officer of the King's African Rifles wrote about them. Quote, the Nubians became the most feared and influential ethnic group in Uganda, mercilessly suppressing uprisings and tribal suppruts at the behest of their British masters. It was the success of these early operations that gave them contempt for all pagan and Christian tribes in the country. In 1974, a journalist named David Martin echoed this sentiment. Quote, among their fellow countrymen, they enjoyed an unenviable reputation of having one of the world's highest homicide rates. The Nubians were renowned for their sadistic brutality, lack of formal education, for poisoning enemies, and for the refusal to integrate, even in the urban centers. Martin was in Uganda to write about one Nubian in particular, one of the deadliest warriors to ever serve in the king's African rifles, a man named Idi Amin. Okay, wow. Okay, so that's... Let's, these guys sound like black Republicans to me. <laughs> You well, guys are on the wrong team. I mean, they're, they're, they're like, th- did they ever have a choice? Like, no. Yeah, exactly. You're right. <laughs> if you recruit a people as soldiers for a mm-hmm. hundred years and don't really give them any other options for anything to do, it's 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 not going to be pretty. Yeah, I hear that. I yeah. mean, I grew up in a bad neighborhood, also, but <laughs> I didn't become a tough warrior. <laughs> I just became a comedian with a smart mouth. <laughs> I'm sure there were a few Nubian comedians, and that like <laughs> part of the difficulty here is like all these stories about how brutal they are are coming from like right. British and American white guys. Yeah, totally. They're probably just like pretty cool. They're probably just like I don't know, trying to invent <laughs> whatever. A sports game that they had from <laughs> trying to play some football and they were like well these guys are brutal they're kicking our ass <laughs> well i mean it's like british football so yeah for sure can it be i but. mean i feel like if colonizers came over to africa and then the africans just like dunked a basketball they'd be like whoa these brutal <laughs> power <laughs> it's a shame <laughs> that basketball didn't make it over there first no i know <laughs> um So Idi Amin was born sometime between 1925 and 1928. We don't really know for sure. Um, He was probably born in the village of Kaboko in northwest Uganda. He was for sure a Kakwa, which were one of the Nubian tribes the British considered to be a warrior people. Mm -hmm. Now, Idi's father served with the British Army in the King's African Rifles and was generally out of the picture. His mother is usually described as a witch or a self-proclaimed sorceress. Um, I watched a documentary uh, when I was sort of prepping for this thing Mm -hmm. uh, that was called I mean, the rise and fall, and it was it was a terrible documentary. It's one okay. of those like '90s made-for-TV movies where all the acting's bad, and it's very sensational. It it's leans super into biased, the, super biased, mm-hmm. and it leans into this stuff that I think what most people have heard about Idi Amin, which was like witchcraft, cannibalism, that sort of thing. Okay, which we'll be we'll be talking about a little bit later, but is uh, I mean that just sounds like uh, Los Angeles <laughs> culture, <laughs> witchcraft and <laughs> cannibalism. Yeah, astrology and veganism. Not much, not so much cannibalism. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paleo I would say diet. veganism's yeah some, a better ism than cannibalism. <laughs> yeah, but. I would say. <laughs> But we're we're going to get into uh, sort of how a lot of these facts are unreliable about Itty. But the cool. way that this terrible documentary summed up Itty's childhood, uh, I found humorous, which is the child grew up by the river, learning the ways of manhood and the spells of witchcraft. Which <laughs> that sort of sums up, I think, the general uh-huh. common popular perception of who this guy was. Yeah, right? it sounds like he fished a lot. Oof, boy, yeah. There's always there's gonna be a lot of dark stories about rivers whenever you read about the. It's it's the same. They're scary. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> How did the ocean get to the land that way? <laughs> yeah, it's one of those like anytime you read about a place with that's like famous for its rivers and mm-hmm. they have some sort of like horrible butchery happen. There's just always tons of stories about kids finding heads in the rivers. We were just in the Cambodia one. It was the same thing. Just like, heads. I mean, you find all kinds of weird stuff in there. Yeah. Tbh. So yeah, the witchcraft stuff is almost certainly racist bullshit. Uh, While witchcraft was Mm -hmm. and is still common in parts of Uganda, Amin was a practicing Muslim. Ugandan Muslims had their own kind of witchcrafty tradition where people would use the Quran to foretell the future. And he certainly used that. uh, But he wasn't doing like pagan blood magic or anything like that. Yeah, all of this sounds like astrology so far. What what was (laughs) the sign, does it say? (laughs) Well, it was like the the Islamic version of astrology. (laughs) Oh, okay. But I don't know, probably Aquarius. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> um, witchcraft was less of a factor in his regime than the traditions and Brit- uh, rituals of his beloved British army. 
Um, so Itty was eventually abandoned by his father and by some accounts his mother too. It's kind of hard to tell what happened there. Mm. He got as far as the fourth grade before he dropped out of school. When he was at most 17, a British colonial army officer noted his tremendous size and recruited him into the King's African Rifles. He started his service as a cook's assistant, literally peeling potatoes, which is like the stereotypical bottom of the rung army job. Mm-hmm. But It kind of seems like if you're big that you shouldn't be a rifleman. <laughs> We're going to make you target. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, go ahead. <laughs> you're a pragmatic man yeah, I, th- I mean I, th- I would only recruit the little guys <laughs> most feared army yeah. ever <laughs> um, he didn't stay at the bottom long Itty mm-hmm. was gigantic he was like 6 foot 4 well over 200 pounds and he was in his younger days he gets kind of heavier as an older guy but in it, like okay. you look at pictures of him and he's young he is solid muscle like okay. he is just a mountain of a man yeah me too <laughs> he's got about 3 inches on me <laughs> and that's about it <laughs> so he was a perfect candidate to become a heavyweight boxer uh, which is exactly what ah, happened. Okay. Uh, according to Robert Keeley, deputy chief of the U.S. mission in Kampala, quote, his advancements came essentially through boxing. He was very tall with, with tremendous reach and big hands. He was big and strong and tough in general. You could picture <laughs> him in any culture as a heavyweight champion, and that's what he was. The Ugandans are very fine boxers. They still prove it to this day in the Olympics. They have a strong boxing tradition, which the British encouraged. The main avenue for advancement in the army was boxing. Um, so Amin eventually became the heavyweight champion of the army, and in 1951 to 52, the heavyweight champion of all Uganda. Okay. Um, his ability to punch people proved useful in maintaining discipline among other soldiers in his unit. Here's another quote from Keeley. Uh, Idi Amin became prominent as the link between the two, the officers sitting around sipping their tea or their brandy or their port. Upon hearing some noises and disruptions outside, would call in Sergeant Amin and tell him to take care of the problem. Amin goes out. There are some shouts and screams as he knocks him heads together and kicks him butt, and then silence. The officers resume their sipping and are very appreciative of Edie's performance. Jeez Louise. <laughs> they eventually made him the top sergeant. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, because, of course, sergeant was as high as uh, an actual African could raise in the King's African Rifles. Mm-hmm. You were not allowed to have any Africans be officers in any of the British colonial armies in Got that it. part of the world. Or, I think, in India, for that matter. Which is, you know, if you're a, a racist colonial power, you mm-hmm. don't want anybody in your army. You, you can't have... Like, you've got to recruit soldiers from the locals, but you don't want them learning about supply lines and logistics and stuff. Yeah, good point. Yeah, then they'll know how to, you know, overthrow the seven guys that you have there. Yeah, that's why I am i haven't been promoted to any officer <laughs> ranks. I mean, how's your boxing? I mean, very, very, very bad. <laughs> but if we're talking about a, a Wii game, <laughs> then uh, still very bad. <laughs> So we need an army where, yeah, where we is the prod. The, the, <laughs> I mean, with drones nowadays, that's that's Go on. that's the future. Yeah. I feel like that's the future. Drone boxing. Yeah. I, I hear you. Um, so it was the uh, perfect soldier for the British Empire. Everyone who served with him in those days was impressed both by his toughness and by his almost superhuman strength. His commanding officer, Ian Graham, said that his body was, quote, like that of a Grecian sculpture. During one terrible march, when all of the other men could barely continue— Quote, one man was an example and an inspiration to us all. As we finally passed the finishing post, Idi Amin was marching beside me at the head of the column, head held high and still singing for all he was worth. Across one shoulder were two Bryn guns, and a Bryn is a he- like a machine gun. It's mm-hmm. like a 22-pound like machine gun that you you know put on a tripod on the ground. So you right. had two of those in one hand, and over the other was a crippled Ascari. And the Ascari was a British word for like a local soldier. So he had one of his wounded comrades on one arm Jeez. and two machine guns on the other. That's like the kind of soldier he made. He was just he was he was like uh, he, was, he was a super soldier. Man, he invented CrossFit apparently. <laughs> yeah. This guy's some Joe Rogan alpha brain kind of guy. Now Ian Graham said that seeing this reminded him of a translation of another of a King's African Rifles marching song. Uh the, I'm about to read you the song which is uh explains sort of how the British viewed men. No, like sing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's. <laughs> I think I can do a good British accent uh-huh. here, but I don't know that I can sing a good British I mean, British does it accent. even rhyme? I don't it think does. In- oh, okay. It does. I'm it, impressed. It definitely rhymes, and it's a bit racist. Uh, um, okay, great. Now, it, for this, you, know, you need to understand the word Sudi is another word for Nubian. Okay. Like, it's like a local term for like people who are from his group of, of Ugandans. Uh, so, here's the British fighting song that this guy thought of when he saw Idi Amin marching. It's the Sudi, my boy. It's the Sudi with his grim set ugly face, but he looks like a man and he fights like a man, for he comes of a fighting race. Which 
that's exactly what these people were to the British. Is so the whole song? Huh? <laughs> so the whole I song. assume there was more, but okay. this was the line that this guy recalled. Which is like, it, it shows you exactly what the British thought of these guys, is that they are soldiers. That's mm-hmm. why, and that's what they were bred for and encouraged for, and they didn't have to do, people of like the Kakwa tribe didn't have to do anything other than send their sons to fight for the British army, and the mm-hmm. British would take care of them. And did they respond with their own diss track, or? Um, I, I know how these beats go. I think they saw this as a diss track okay. at that point. <laughs> that's too bad. Yeah, it, it, it is, and it gets, yeah, it gets badder. Um, so young Amin was sent to war several times on behalf of the British Empire. In 1949, he went to Somalia to suppress the Shifta Rebellion. In 1952, he went sent to Kenya to suppress the Mau Mau Uprising. We don't talk about the Mau Mau Uprising a lot these days, but it basically started as a bunch of Kenyan rebels who were angry because mm-hmm. angry the British were whipping people half to death. Which okay. is, that's how British kept discipline in all their African colonies, was just horrific amounts of whipping. Um, so these guys rose up and they killed some British people and the British sent an army in and brutally suppressed it. They put more than one and a half million Kenyans in concentration camps. Mm. They hanged thousands of them. Edie probably would have been doing a good amount of the hanging. Mm. Um, and he also killed a number of warriors in vicious battles in places like Kenyoma and Kangima. So he's been raised just as a soldier and now he's been brutalized, suppressing multiple colonial wars very violently man successful black man and (laughs) then he just turned around and betrays his culture (laughs) classic story i mean he kind of starts with the betrayal right yeah many later well we'll get to later (laughs) right now actually oh man there's more okay great there's a lot uh, so by the late 1950s, Itty had risen as high as an African could in the King's African Rifles, uh, which is sergeant. The British, yeah, as I said, didn't let their locals be officers in their armies. Uh, this policy came back to bite them in the ass in the late 50s, because by that point it had become clear that colonialism was on its way out. The British were preparing to release Uganda as an independent nation. Unfortunately, the British hadn't governed any of their colonies as countries. They basically just treated them as money-making enterprises, corporations essentially, with all of the business of statecraft kept out of the hands of the locals. The British were required by international, you know, the international community to leave Uganda with an army so it could defend itself. Mm. But they hadn't trained any sort of officer corps into Uganda, um, which is an important thing to have, which is why every military in the world has an officer corps. You know, you train people to do certain jobs, but the Ugandans just didn't have that. And rather than spend more money and time to build an officer corps for their soon-to-be country, the British just randomly promoted the sergeants they liked best. Mm. One of those sergeants was a boxer with a fourth-grade education named Idi Amin. This is an okay, cool. Yeah. He was commissioned in 1962, right before Ugandan independence. He found himself in charge of a platoon in northwest Kenya, captured a bunch of prisoners, and ordered them to be executed. The British governor of Uganda, Sir Walter Coates, vetoed the possibility of Idi being charged for this war crime. I mean, was one of the few African soldiers in the entire officers in the entire army, and prosecuting him right before independence was deemed politically undesirable. No one stopped to consider whether or not it might be bad for Uganda if one of their high-ranking military leaders was a war criminal. Okay. So, when we get back, we're going to get into how Idi Amin rose to power and to be the president of Uganda, and what happened next, which uh, it's going to be a dark story, but uh, great. We, we, have, uh, we have some ads first off. Okay, great. And before we get into some ads, uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about the Doritos people. We're trying to get Doritos to sponsor the podcast. Oh, I hear you. I love that crunchy crunch of that, the, the Doritos chip. Nothing washes the horrible taste of colonialism out of your mouth. Like, like a cool ranch. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say nacho cheese, but that's what's okay. great about Doritos is freedom. <laughs> the, the freedom... <laughs> to cleanse your palate with whatever exciting flavor combination you want. How are they not a sponsor yet? I Well, maybe they will be after this video. Jeez Louise. <laughs> Let's hear from some other sponsors. And we're back. And we're back. Oh, uh, sorry, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Yeah, I, I did want to get into, before we dig into the rest of the story, what you recall about Idi Amin before we, we get into his career. Um, not much. I have heard the name before. I've heard that he was the president of Uganda who's a bad guy. I don't know the details. I mean, already I've learned way more than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, before, you know, it, it was even, it even became an independent nation. I didn't realize that, you know, they killed so many people. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it was one of those things I had I had vaguely heard. Yeah, he was president of Uganda. There were these rumors of witchcraft and cannibalism. Um, I hadn't known any of this stuff about sort of how the British military worked at the time mm-hmm. and the fact that he 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 was basically bred to suppress insurgencies. Like that's what the British used his people for was controlling populations through brutality. Um, which I think is an important thing to get into here because yeah. otherwise it's just a, a story of like this dictator, but he didn't rise up out of anything. He was like, and I, I think he the, went up through the system. He paid his dues, and he was also trained. Like you're going to, we're, when we get into the things he did in Uganda that were brutal, mm-hmm. they're all echoes of things he was doing for the British. Mm-hmm. Like they, like it's it's not just a story of like some horrible dictator rose up and did terrible things. It's the British trained this guy to do terrible things on their behalf and then abandoned the country of Uganda to him. And yeah, this is basically, this guy is completely might meets right, and um, yeah, that's dangerous. It's, it's really dangerous. dangerous. Worldview. And it's dangerous if you don't, like, people like that exist in every culture. We've got more than our fair share of them in the United States. Mm-hmm. We have a We have structures built up to, like, make sure that those people don't wind up in charge of the military or whatever. Like, yeah. <laughs> At least not to the extent where it's like, you know, th- there's a reason we've never had the army seize power. Like, it's it's, it's in our country. Yeah. We've definitely. It's, it's, you, well, it's, it's, it's because we give them so much money. <laughs> cool. Um, okay. So, not just cool. Cool ranch. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to Idi, I mean. All right. Um, but seriously, Doritos people, send us a, drop us a line. Get at us. We're a, at Bastard's Pod on Twitter. Yeah, Idi Amin has just committed a war crime right before Uganda and independence, and the British governor of Uganda has sort of hushed up the whole thing because he's one of the only officers, and they didn't want to, you know, they just they just didn't any, want any complications. They said it would be mm-hmm. politically undesirable if this came up right before independence. So, uh, Idi Amin, now an officer, rises again rapidly through the ranks, according to Robert Keeley. Uh, he advanced by eliminating his rivals in one fashion or another, either physically or by discrediting them or by scaring them or some way or another. His promotions came frequently. So he's good at working the system. Um, mm-hmm. He understands how the British military works. And Respect the hustle. Yeah. And if there's one man who knows how to hustle, it's Idi Amin. Now, on October 9th, 1962, Uganda gains its independence from Great Britain. Uh, Uganda's first prime minister was a guy named Milton Obote, and the president was a guy named Edward Mutesa. Mutesa was also the king of the Baganda, who were a southern tribe in Uganda. He was better known as King Freddy. Uh, for a little while, Mutesa and Obote coexisted, and things were all right in Uganda. Mm-hmm. Um, Milton Obote, like Idi Amin, came from northern Uganda. He advocated for a great African awakening. He was a socialist, although not a very dogmatic one. Uh, the West generally disliked him, um, but he was also super corrupt, which is going to be a theme in this story. So by 1964, Idi Amin had been named Deputy Army Commander under a dude with the really cool name Shaban Opalot, which is one of my favorite names that I've encountered in this mm-hmm. podcast research. Um, he saw action again, fighting alongside Katanga rebels who were battling the government of Zaire. And he took gold and diamonds from the rebels and gave them guns from the Ugandan army in exchange. He then sold the loot for cash. Abote, the president, got in on the racket. There was a brief parliamentary inquiry, but Abote had all the other people in the scheme arrested, and so he and he and Eddie were fine. Um, now in 1966, Abote got tired of sharing power and suspended the constitution. He sent Colonel Idi Amin mm-hmm. to attack the palace and bring the king back, dead or alive. The king managed to flee the country, but the coup succeeded, and Abote was left as the sole power in Uganda. Now, this did not make the British happy. Um, the Baganda were their favorite tribe in Uganda. Winston Churchill, Under Secretary of State for the Colonies from 1905 to 1908. Great guy. Yeah. Super good guy. Never caused a famine that Never killed four and a half million them. people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> not, not even, well, once, but <laughs> let he among us who has not starved everyone, four and a half million. Yeah, everyone yeah. makes mistakes. We all cause a couple of famines, <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, he considered the Baganda to be civilized, um, which means basically that they'd all converted to Christianity easily. Their territory was just where the British wound up putting the railroad and their administration buildings. Mm-hmm. So the Bagandans were the people the British had spent the most time with in Uganda. They considered them civilized because they acted like British people. They're the good ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, now, the Ugandan people, most of whom weren't Bagandans, uh, supported Abote's 
kicking down the king. Um, they saw him as casting down a British-backed monarch. They saw this as a true break from the past and a chance at a new beginning. It was an exciting time, but the excitement soon faded in the reality of Abote's ridiculous corruption. Uh, people protested, of course, and by 1969, the government could only stay in power with the military's backing. Uh, Edie had been popular with the British because he was a great soldier and because he spoke English with just the right accent that made them think he was cute and dumb because they were racist as fuck. Mm. But Edie was not dumb. While the government had grown more dependent on his military, he started recruiting hundreds of his relatives and fellow Nubians into the army and putting them in the positions he would want them in when it was time to take power. Um, this was disrupted in 1970 when an assassin tried to kill President Abote and shot him through the mouth. American diplomat Bovu Now recalled, The army went amuck, and for about 12 hours it was a pretty horrifying situation. Idi appears to have gotten confused and thought the attempt was a coup against both him and Abote, so he ran. Uh, he, quote, jumped out the back window of his house in his pajamas and disappeared, which really mystified us all, because they were expecting that hmm. this assassination attempt was him seizing power, but it was just somebody else. So he was mocked for weeks in the wake of the attack because he ran out in the night in his pajamas, and a number of people counted him out as a force in Ugandan politics at this point. But Idi embarked on a redemption tour. Part of that was having a bunch of people clandestinely executed in the night, Part of it was showing up in public with a bunch of his armed friends and just scaring people. Uh, Nall was there for part of that, too. He was out at a bar one night, and he, quote, you know, he saw, he saw Itty, uh, quote, I walked out of the bar, and there was a mean, a huge man, an enormous fellow, with his officers and their weapons sitting in the main lounge, st sitting at attention, not talking, just looking around. I thought, Jesus, what's going to happen? They sat there for about half an hour, and then Amin said something in one of the local languages, and they all got up and walked out of there. What it was, I'm convinced to this day, was a threat on, part, on the part of Amin about reestablishing his position. He knew that he was laughed at because he ran away. This was his reprisal, his counter threat, and it worked. People were scared to death. So they might have been more scared by the fact that Idi had had a, a number of people killed. Yeah, and the fact that he just sat there for a half hour for his head, like, that's crazy. Yeah, it was a little <laughs> bit like some, some guy just sits in the bar staring at you with like his friends and all their guns. You know, that's intimidating. So yeah, uh, in 1971, President Abote went to Singapore for a conference. Uh, before he left, he put out the order that Idi Amin was to be arrested for massive corruption and murder, which Idi was guilty of, but which Abote was guilty of too. Mm -hmm. uh, before the warrant could be served, Idi Amin launched, launched his coup. Uh, the killing started right away. At least a thousand soldiers from tribes that Idi didn't trust were massacred. The river filled with corpses, um, which is, you know. So when you tell the story, like, when I hear stories like this, I'm I'm like I don't even know where all these people. How many people are, are they going to kill before they just completely run out of people? You know, <laughs> it's it, like geez Louise. They, yeah, they 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 really go pretty far. And by the time this is all over, Itty will have killed something like one in fifty-seven of the people in Uganda. <sighs> um, and he's not the worst of them, which we'll get to as well. Oh my gosh, he's just the one that everyone focuses on because there's rumors that he ate people. Wow. Um, so Nal was the American diplomatic officer in Uganda, uh, so he had responsibility for all of the 800-ish American citizens and country. Uh, he told those people to hold fast and chill at home, and that went fine. But there was also a tourist group in town who were furious that this coup got in the way of their vacation. So I want to read this story just because it's a okay. little bit of levity. It's just okay. Americans. It's a Yelp review in here. It's rich Americans acting like rich Americans in the middle of a coup that's life and death for the Fantastic. people in Uganda. We just wanted to go on a nice vacation, <laughs> hunt some endangered animals. <laughs> I said to them, look, the airport is closed. And later the tour leader turned to me and said, well, Mr. Now, these are important people. They haven't got time to wait around. They're going to miss their connections in Nairobi. I said, you're damn right they're going to miss their connections in Nairobi. And they're going to get hungry. They're going to get tired. They're going to get dirty. And they're going to want to get their laundry done. And it's not going to be done because I don't see any chance of these folks leaving for four or five days. And that was just the case. Mm. They were furious. One guy, the president of this big liquor distributing company in Hartford, Connecticut, high blood or hue mind or something he beat me about that on the head and shoulders he said he had to get back to sign a contract i said you can't do it there are soldiers at the airport who will kill you um which yeah i, I just love <laughs> like there's people getting murdered in the street and you're like i've got a contract to get back to <laughs> yeah that sounds like every screenplay where a businessman is in there. <laughs> his inconvenience yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, there's a terrorist hijacking the airplane, and he's like, I'm going to miss the account. I got to get home for Christmas. <laughs> 
Um, so, okay, that was a nice little interlude. So in short order, Idi Amin is the new president of Uganda. Uh, that's a position he would hold for more than eight years. The Western powers, mainly the British and the Americans, were hopeful at first. Uh, they hated Abote because he was a socialist and because he was even more corrupt than they were prepared to forgive. Idi Amin had a good reputation among the British. He trained as a paratrooper in Israel, so Israel really liked the guy too. Um, so yeah, at first it seems like this new dictator is going to be great for white people. Uh, you know, uh, Lady Listowell, who was a Hungarian noblewoman and a journalist who became Idi's first biographer, met him around this time. And here's how she described meeting him for the first time to give you an idea of like how this guy comes across. Quote, I looked into the smiling face of a tall, muscular officer with shrewd eyes who invited me to a cup of coffee. He was a hulking figure of a man, and I was fascinated by his hands, beautiful, slim hands with long, tapering fingers. We get it. You're horny. <laughs> I just love, we we did a podcast on King Leopold of Belgium, the Uh guy who massacred 15 million people in the Congo. And in his biography, there is like a whole paragraph talking about how beautiful his hands were. So I just, that's apparently, that's now, if I can find one more, that's officially a trend. His hands were, (laughs) His beautiful hands. (laughs) I'm just always shocked that apparently some people are really staring at hands a lot. Yeah, I know. And you never hear about, like, you know, his cuticles weren't not well manicured. <laughs> yeah. His fingernails were a little long. <laughs> Just really, yeah, yeah. There were actually reasons that a reasonable person who wasn't, you know, purely looking at this from, like, the British point of view might have thought Idi Amin had a shot at being a good president. Uh, for one thing, he was a fun guy. Everybody who met him really spoke highly of him. Like, everybody, like even sure. people who later were like, oh, yeah, he definitely committed atrocities. He was charming. He was <gasps> A fun guy to be around. <laughs> yeah, I met him and I was so scared. I was like, "This guy is gonna kill me." So I was like, "Ha ha ha! <laughs> <laughs> nice guy, great guy." Um, he was obsessed with Scotland, which is one of the Weird. other famous things about Idi. I mean, yeah, all of the officers in um, the so King's African and Rifles. Stuff? Yeah, and he had he loved people playing bagpipes. Bagpipes. Weird. Yeah, yeah, all of the officers in the King's African Rifles had been Scottish, and so Edie just really loved Scottish culture. He had huge, he had a, a whole plane. I do remember yeah. seeing him in like clothing and he's wearing like plaid and stuff. And there's a movie about him that's not super accurate, but uh, it's called The Last King of Scotland. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and he had a whole plane dedicated to just bringing Scottish whiskey into uh, Uganda. Like that was like a, a presidential plane that's okay. it's just the Whiskey Express. Which is a cool thing to dedicate to call a plane, a plane? to. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 legitimately fine. Um, <laughs> hey, are you cool to fly? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> no, we have a vodka guy fly the Whiskey Express. He's fine until he gets home. <laughs> uh, Itty adopted a number of British military traditions uh, for his own military. He sent a musician to Scotland for a year to learn the bagpipes. Mm. He also established a state military jazz band with perhaps the best name of, for a band I've ever heard. Okay. The Revolutionary Suicide Jazz Band. Okay. <laughs> also known as the Revolutionary Suicide Mechanized Regiment Band or the Suicide Mechanized Jazz Band. And here's their... Oh, were, they, were they like a punk band? No, they were just a jazz band. Jeez, they should have been a punk band. Why That's did they a call fucking... themselves Suicide? They were this is the... a dope picture. This is a, a really great picture. They were the regimental band. They were a military band. And the band they were a unit for was one of the elite mechanized regiments in the Ugandan army that was the suicide mechanized regiment. So it was like to try to make them sound scary. These guys don't care if they die. They're the suicide regiment. For sure. Uh, And this amazing picture with several others will be up on our website, BehindTheBastards.com. You owe it to yourself to check it out. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So it also seems, I should note, that from from reports at the time, most of the musicians in the Suicide Revolutionary Jazz Band were sort of press ganged and forced to play. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they don't look exactly happy. <laughs> they, do, they don't look jazz. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, so, <laughs> Itty's reign was brutal by all measures uh, and got increasingly brutal as time went on. There are a number of theories as to why. Robert Keeley thinks he was just promoted out of his depth like Michael Scott. Basically, mm. he was a fine sergeant, but he never should have been an officer, let alone running the nation. Uh, which is one way or another probably fair. Keeley says, quote, he had learned to use his fists and translated that into how you hold your position, how you protect yourself. He applied all of the brutal boxing lessons he had learned against his rivals. Uh, Lady Listowell also thought that this poor guy had just been forced to jump into a position too complex for his mind. 
Quote, the Kakwa have a great respect for personalities, but not for rank or position. They never had chiefs or recognized clan leaders. Mm. Amin was brought up to believe that all Kakwa tribesmen are equal. Some of his recent measures illustrate all too well that he had to leap from a peasant background into the complicated politics of the modern world without any intermediate feudal preparation. I think this attitude that Edie was just a guy who got promoted beyond his talents is inaccurate and based pretty heavily in racism. Mm -hmm. It shifts the the blame over to Uganda for letting such a man rise that high. And I think the real blame lies with the British. Uh, Again, there's guys like Idi in every country, uh, violent authoritarians who seek to impose their will on others. Established nations build antibodies up, checks and balances in legal systems and established bureaucracies to stop men with fourth grade educations and histories of head injuries from heading the army. Boy, that sounds nice right about now. Well, clearly ours aren't perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, but, you know, Uganda didn't have... Any, any of that. The British didn't put any of that in place before they just abandoned them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, like, it's one of those things where if you look at what was set up when the, the Uganda was freed, I don't see someone like Itty was bound to at least try to take control. Yeah, it sounds like they set up the country like a reality show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is almost like that. Yeah, they were like, here you guys go, here's some sticks, survive. And they didn't, they didn't consider any of the ways it could go badly. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't, like, they know... Like, the British have never had a military coup, and they, they have an officer cadre for a reason. They, like, set, like, they know how you set up a military so it doesn't destroy the country. Mm-hmm. And they didn't do any of that in Uganda because they were lazy, and they mm-hmm. didn't care. Uh, so, f- fuck, the, fuck the British Yeah, Empire. fuck them. <laughs> and Flint, Michigan still doesn't have clean water. Yeah, and fuck us, too, for yeah. sure, for sure, for sure. <laughs> this one is... Actually, this one's sort of our bad, too, because we 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 supported the Idi Amin regime for a while, we being the United States. Fuck us. Fuck everybody. Fuck everybody. <laughs> except for Uganda. They didn't and deserve s- any of this. Except for Doritos. <laughs> now, Doritos had nothing to do with this. Okay, okay that's uh, good to know. That's that's fair. And, and you could argue that Doritos has stopped similar monsters from arising in other countries by filling them with nacho goodness. Yeah, that's right. You stop the monster of hunger. As far as we know, Idi Amin never got to experience extreme nacho flavor. Mm-hmm. And that might be the secret of his madness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only extremism he should have been into is nacho cheesy crunch (laughs) (laughs) so yeah when the british first started the ugandan colony they had carried out a policy of bringing in south asians mostly from india to uganda to quote serve as a buffer between europeans and africans in the middle rungs of commerce and administration this had started when the british brought thirty thousand indians over to build railways in uganda uh these folks had a lot more experience with western style capitalism than the average ugandan and as a result they saw great success setting up businesses in the new colony by the early 1970s, Ugandan Asians owned 90% of the country's businesses and contributed 90% of its tax revenue, despite making up a small minority of the actual population. Uh, this had obviously caused a lot of unrest between native ethnic Ugandans and the Ugandan Asians. Mm. Uh, President Dabote had pursued a policy called Africanization, which attacked Ugandan Asians with laws aimed at reducing their economic dominance. Idi expanded on that policy and added in a healthy dollop of straight-up racism. He announced that the government would be reviewing the status of Ugandan Asians who'd been given citizenship. So basically they were looking at naturalized Ugandan citizens mm-hmm. and finding excuses to take away their citizenship. Yeah, that's we- what's happening right right now yes it's mm-hmm. exactly what's happening right now to naturalized american citizens mm-hmm. um which is a uh, uh, huge bummer mm-hmm. huge bummer weird how these shitty guys have the same playbook in a lot of cases yeah um it uh i mean also canceled all in progress uh citizenship applications from asians uh and then in august of 1972 he gave all asians in uganda 90 days to vacate the country so we're going to get into how that policy went and what a clusterfuck ensued afterwards and what happened once the West finally decided that Idi Amin wasn't their man. But first, we've got uh, some some capitalism to get into. Oh, yay. Yay. Capitalism, the thing that has nothing to do with the with... tens of millions of deaths to colonialism. <laughs> Not a thing. Not a thing. Here's some ads. And we're back. Uh, so as the story has, has come up here, Idi Amin has seized power. And he's executed a bunch of people. And he has decided to expel all of the Asians in Uganda. Uh, he's given them 90 days to vacate the country. 
This policy affected 85,000 people, 23,000 of whom were already citizens of Uganda. Mm. Uh, I'm going to play a clip of Idi Amin talking to the press uh, to hear how he justified the policy. And I think what's interesting about this is how friendly the foreign press is to him, which sort of gives you an idea of how charming this guy was in person. So even though he's introduced, he's talking about something pretty awful. Like mm -hmm. people are, they just, yeah, just, I'll play it. Decision for the economy of Uganda. And I must make sure that every Ugandan get a fruit of independence. Since independent, actually Uganda is not yet independent, I will say that, even when the British handed over on the 9th of October 1962, the Uganda still not yet independent. Uganda will be independent after this, my decision, after I want to see that the whole Kampala street is not full of Indians. It Indian? must be proper black and uh, administration in those shops is run by the Ugandans. Would you like to get all Asians out, really, sir? Yes, they must go to their country. Even what? nationals of Uganda? If they want to go, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are welcome to go. You what will happen to these people if they don't go by the time they leave? I think they will be sitting like they are sitting on the fire. I will tell you this. Uh, you just wait after three months. What will you do to them? Okay, you will see. <laughs> you, you, you said you wanted you, you Uganda. I think they will not sit comfortable here in Uganda. I will tell you this. I must actually tell you the truth. You Have you asked the one British to take them away? Sir? That you are doing camp for them if they are not doing? I am not responsible for building them transit camp. But Have you asked the British to take them away, sir? Yes, it is a British High Commission is here, his responsibility. Yes. I you, have told him. You've said you wanted to teach Britain a lesson, President. Why is that? And that is now a lesson I'm teaching the British. <laughs> <laughs> I am teaching now the lesson because I am correcting them from the mistake they had made. If they had think before earlier that there is an African here who can even work under building the railway with the instruction given to them by the British, this problem will not happen. Isn't this gonna wow, that was like a Monty Python. <laughs> yeah. <sketch. laughs> it's remarkable that he's like talking about like these 80,000 people. people, terrible things will happen to them if they don't leave. And then all of these guys laugh. Mm -hmm. Like just because it's... Disgusting. It's, yeah, and it's so... I mean, he has a point at the end there when he says like it was fucked up of the British to bring these people in to build railroads mm -hmm. and not just have us build railroads because it's our fucking country, which is, you know, a fair point. But at this point, these guys are like third generation Ugandans. Mm -hmm. Like it's messed up to kick people out of your country and take their businesses. It's just weird to me how friendly the press was to him still at this point. Well, they were all British guys and they didn't really give a fuck about brown people either way. They were just there because they had to be. Yeah, and they thought he he was he was fun, and they mm -hmm. liked. Yeah, it's yeah. So Idi's main defense of his policy was that he was trying to give Uganda back to Ugandans. Uh, he also said that God had told him in a dream that South Asians were to blame for Uganda's economic woes and corruption. It's probable that this policy had a lot to do with the fact that Great Britain had just refused to sell him guns so he could invade Tanzania. So he was basically just being like, "Okay, Great Britain, you have to deal with eighty thousand refugees now because you wouldn't." give me the weapons I needed to fuck mm. with my neighbor. Idi was brutal to the Ugandan Asians, but he was equally brutal to ethnic Ugandans. His particular targets were Acholi and Langi tribesmen. Uh, in the first few days of his regime, he executed more than a thousand members of these tribes in the army. Uh, as his reign wore on, the purges spread from the military to the general population. Bullets were in short supply in the country and desperately needed for all the wars Idi planned to start, so the murder squads he dispatched had to find other ways of doing their work. Their preferred tools were sledgehammers, crowbars, and sometimes crocodiles. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you have crocodiles, every problem looks like a crocodile. Food. No one who's ever wielded a crocodile has been a good guy. <laughs> it's never a tool of the good guys. No. <laughs> what about... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the most feared government agency, sort of the Idi Amin uh, equivalent of the German SS, was uh, the State Research Bureau, which is maybe my favorite name for like a secret police organization. It just sounds so like... <laughs> yeah, that scares me. Seems like the guys who should be like, oh yeah, your soil's pH is off, but <laughs> yeah, okay. these are the murder police, as opposed to, you know, countries where all of the police are the murder police. Mm -hmm. Um Anyway, Apollo Lowoko survived 196 days in the pink stucco building where they tortured and executed their captives. 
He gives us our clearest picture of what life was like for people deemed by Idi Amin to be enemies of the state. Quote, when the prisoner's name was called out, the guards would go and grab him. We were all in handcuffs already. We were in handcuffs 24 hours a day, but they would change the position when they called a man, putting them on and back, and then they would place a long rope with a loop around his neck. Then someone would drag him by the rope along the staircase going up to the ground floor, and people would be beating him on all parts of his body. Then his head would be beaten in. By the time he reached the top of the stairs, he was dead. So Luoco claims the guards made sure the prisoners saw every execution. That was part of the point. Mm. He claims that between 150 and 200 people were executed every night while he was there in 1977. Luoco believes he saw more than 15,000 Ugandans clubbed and beaten to death over just five months. Uh, at least 250,000 Ugandans perished during Idi Amin's terror, and the real number may be more like half a million. It, roughly one in every 57 were to die over the next eight years. So Idi himself is said to have participated in a number of these murders. Luoko claims to remember seeing him beat men to death with sledgehammers while wearing a gas mask. Quote, Amin was actually participating. He turned to us at one point and told us to relax. The State Research Bureau men were mostly Nubians, like Idi, former super soldiers of the British Empire, doing what they'd always done, just for themselves now. Um, and again, this is not savagery that he's executing suddenly now that he's in charge. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what he was doing mm -hmm. on British orders in Kenya. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and guess that when he was president is not the first time he had people killed with sledgehammers. <laughs> like... It, uh, it is it's it never ceases to amaze me just the capability of brutality of some people no and these all all these deaths like obviously these deaths are an idiot mean but they're also on colonialism mm -hmm. um which is well yeah for sure yeah. i blame everything on colonialism just so we're straight and that you can it's totally fair <laughs> yeah. um it's like being a, being a white kid who was educated in the South, mm -hmm. I did not hear very much about colonialism mm -hmm. growing up. And so it's once I've started researching a lot of these guys in the show and, and learning about King Leopold and the 15 million who died in the Belgian Congo, which is probably the worst single crime of colonialism that I've mm -hmm. come across. But like, it's, I think it would probably be fair to say that like, th if you add together the Nazis and the Stalinist and Maoist communists and mm -hmm. all the people they killed, it doesn't come close to the deaths to colonialism. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in a shorter time, you know, the Nazis were great at killing people fast, but there's, you know, we'll never know most of what was done on behalf of the British Empire. Yeah. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so while most secret police organizations uh, wore, you know, wear leather trench coats and dress in all black, it, like, you know, like a, you're, cat, you're in central casting, you're trying to like cast a secret police, aid. like they're all in black, they look like the Matrix guys. Yeah, they're wearing turtlenecks, Not they're wearing the wraparounds and glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not the men of the research bureau. Okay. They wore, wore flowered Hawaiian shirts, platform shoes, and sunglasses. Oh no, oh. they're dressed real cool like me. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I I appreciate someone doing it different. If you're if you're gonna massacre hundreds of thousands of people, at least try a new. You know, there's no armbands here. It's it's, yeah, it's style. Dress like parrot heads, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this wear, is wear sandals. If Stop Jimmy people Buffett, out with sandals, yeah, yeah. If Jimmy Buffett carried out a massacre, it would look like this. Yeah. Every time you kill somebody, you get a lay. Yeah. Well, and you know they're all drunk. With a, they've got a whiskey plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the research bureau headquarters was connected to President Amin's home by an underground tunnel so he could show up and participate in the executions when he wanted to. Most of the work was headed by a man named Major Farouk Menawa. He was sort of the Laverenti Beria type figure, and Beria was the head of the KGB for a while under Stalin. Uh, so he's the kind of guy who could murder his own friends after a night of drinking and hanging out with them. At one point, he had his wife and three daughters executed. Fuck, dude. Yeah. That guy should have waited till Grand Theft Auto came out. <laughs> Just to, to get it out of his system? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, he suspected his wife and daughters were helping Ugandan rebels because they were Bagandas, uh, Bagandas which is like the tribe, one of the mm -hmm. tribes that he hated. Um so yeah, it's important to understand that all the repression apparatus Idi created was very decentralized. So most of the deaths during this period were not Idi Amin signing someone's death warrant. It was as a result of the fact that all soldiers and intelligence officers in his country were allowed to arrest or kill any person they considered dangerous to peace and good order. Man. So Idi gave his men a legal excuse to pursue their personal grudges and steal from people. 
Wow. Um, Abolish ice, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> just putting that, just dropping that in there. No, and that is the official line of the podcast: is abolish ice, Good. buy Doritos. Abolish ice. I'm drinking all water, lukewarm, until ice is abolished. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny that like our Gestapo equivalent is 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 ice because yeah, th- if they had known 15 years ago, they probably would have named it something cooler. Ice is, <sighs> yeah, it's not that cool. It's not that cool. Yeah, um, Amin gave his men excuses, yeah, to pursue personal grudges and steal from people. One survivor recalled, quote, everything you have seen in Wild West movies was everyday life here. Someone bumping off the husband and publicly taking the wife or someone bumping you off and openly driving off with your car. So uh, I hope we presented kind of a picture of how brutal Amin's regime was. Let's dig a little deeper into the man himself. Uh, You can't understand Idi Amin without understanding that he was great at fucking. Uh, Great at fucking? Who wrote that? Well... (laughs) <laughs> at least he he needed everyone to believe that he was great at fucking. Yeah, yeah, so sure. one way or the other, it's th- it's important to understand that that was a part of his public image. That's how you knew it was bad, ladies. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, and and almost all like the only person, the only famous person I'm convinced who was ever actually good at fucking was Benjamin Marlon. Franklin. <laughs> what I was going to say, Marlon Brando. But oh okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, Marlon Brando makes sense. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. he was method. So he was method. Um, anyway, yeah, so uh, Amin was, it was important to him that there be a public image that he was v- virile and good at sex. Uh, his former minister for health, Henry Kiemba, said this. Besides his five wives, also he had five wives. We'll oh, get that's kind of low, honestly, for what I thought. Yeah, no, he's, 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 he's a conservative fellow. Uh, besides his five wives, Amin has had countless other women, many of whom have borne him children. His sex life is truly extraordinary. He regards his sexual energy as a sign of his power and authority. He never tries to hide his lust. His li- eyes lock on to any beautiful woman. His reputation for sexual performance is so startling that women often deliberately make themselves available, and his love affairs have included women of all colors in many nations, from schoolgirls to mature women, from street girls to university lecturers. Mm. Which is, it, it, who knows how true that is? I yeah, mean, it sounds it, like a lot of rape. It definitely, <laughs> definitely a lot because there's a ton of stories of him having husbands executed so he could fuck their wives. Oh my gosh! Um, but this is, you know, his former minister of health giving what is this is what Idi Amin wanted people to hear about him mm-hmm. that he's because this, th- this was important. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm great at fighting and I'm great at fucking. Yeah, he sounds like Wilt Chamberlain. It, there's just something about authoritarian assholes and needing people to believe they're tough and good at fucking. Mm-hmm. I want everyone to know I am bad at sex. <laughs> Which means very smart ladies, bad at sex, good sex over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think about which of our presidents were definitely the best. Because I hear JFK was terrible. Really? Yeah, I've heard. I've heard LBJ said JFK was terrible. Well, you can't trust that guy. You can't trust that guy. <laughs> he was. He was jealous. <laughs> and he I, called us Dick Jumbo, which means he definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe that's true. Then I don't know. Nixon seems pretty bad. Nixon can't have been good, right? No, no way. No. Um, I feel like Teddy Roosevelt. Well, he was in a wheelchair for No, that was long. FDR. Oh, uh, never mind. Well, he was a big stick guy, right? Yeah, Teddy? he was the big stick guy. Yeah, that guy could fuck. That guy could fuck. And I feel like FDR was probably pretty good, but like he would have been like a hands and oral man. That's my guess for FDR. <laughs> I think he leaves them satisfied is what I'm saying. I don't think... I, don't, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Idi Amin, again, had five wives. His favorite wife was a lady named Sarah. Uh, he met her when she was 18 and a go-go dancer for the Revolutionary Suicide Jazz Band. Okay. Um, story as old as time. Uh, Idi fell in love, but tragically, Sarah already had a fiancé, and she was pregnant. So when she gave birth on Christmas Day in 1974, oh, Idi just told everyone the kid was his and had the birth announced on state television. Oh, what the fuck? Sarah's fiancé was not happy with this, but he died in a car crash immediately after this. So oh, it worked out. No suspicion. No. Nope. With that at all. Nope. Just a random car crash the like the day that he complains. Oh, uh, poor guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I shouldn't laugh there. <laughs> I may be getting a little callous with all these stories. I mean, me. it's hard not to disassociate a little bit. I mean, in, so far in the last hour, I've learned of many millions of people dying. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 horrific. Yeah. Um 
So Idi Amin married Sarah in 1975. It was a small private ceremony, but Idi was concerned that having a small private ceremony might be portrayed or might be seen as excluding the people of Uganda. So he remarried her in a gigantic televised ceremony. Yasser Arafat was his best man. The banquet cost $2 million. The banquet, not the whole wedding, mm-hmm. just the which. I, I would kind of want to check out a two. I mean, I've spread. seen Super Sixteen, you know, whatever <laughs> it's called. So, uh, President Amin cut the wedding cake, wedding cake with a sword. Knowing his history, there's no chance he didn't also use that sword to stab people. Obviously, a s- yeah. sword guys, a sword guys, S- fucking sword, sword guys. guys are the problem. <laughs> That's how you know someone That's can't you know. be trusted if they're a fucking sword guy. Mm-hmm. 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 Machete is a people's weapon. <laughs> While you were learning about <laughs> colonialism, I was studying the blockchain. <laughs> uh, so Idi had five wives and something like 40 or 50 children. Uh, he married his first two wives in the same year, 1966, when he was 28. Uh, one of those marriages went all right and produced several children, but his second wife, Kay, divorced him. Idi oh, no. murdered the best man and then murdered Kay. Uh, her arms and legs were found in a sack in the trunk of a car, so Itty had her body sewn back together and marched around in front of his children and other wives. Oh, my God. Or he didn't. So this is, again, where we get into some controversy. Because his kids are still around and talking today and do speeches and, like, oh my several of them have, have – they don't, like, necessarily doubt the crimes that were committed in their mm-hmm. dad's reign. But they are all pretty consistent about the fact that, no, he was a good dad and very normal around us. No. So it's possible this is a, this story is a lie like the witchcraft stuff. Okay. Hard to tell. Because, again, his kids, even today, are all pretty much he – was, he was fun. Um, so he might not have brought it home. Hmm. I really don't know. I, I wasn't don't... there. Yeah, okay. There's, I, th- th- it's, it's one of those things. It's impossible to know the truth. There's stories that he was brutal to his kids and fucking had corpses paraded mm-hmm. around them. And then his kids say stuff like, it, uh, here's a quote from his son. It was fun with my dad all the time. It was fun. Uh, his daughter, Maimuna Amin, said uh, he was such a lovely man, so good, so lovely. He never beats any children. When he's at home, he just wanted us all to be on him. He's like a mother, a father, a sister, a brother in one. He loved music, and he's always on his accordion singing. Wow, what a revisionist history that this chick has. Yeah, I mean, it's also possible that he was a brutal monster everywhere mm-hmm. outside of the home and was fine with his kids. Yeah, and they just never heard about the other stuff. No, they heard about it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Again, they don't. a lot of yeah, them of don't course. deny the brutality of the regime. They're mm. just like, at home, he was a normal guy. That's fucked. Which, that happens. Like, you can find plenty of stories about people hanging out with Hitler and being like, he was super nice, and he was like my uncle. And... Yeah, people always say dictators are charismatic and stuff. I mean, even if we, I feel the uh, same thing with celebrities. I don't really know. But uh... Yeah, I, I, and I can't know. I, what we do mm-hmm. know, and what we do know for certain, is that Idi Amin played the accordion fucking constantly. Mm-hmm. He was apparently, if you're an accordion guy, he was apparently good at playing the accordion. And here is, here's a picture of him doing the Weird Al thing. Oh my god. Right? It's weird that dorks are truly the worst people in the world. Because <laughs> yeah, that's... This guy's in a swords, accordions, bagpipes. <laughs> this guy has bad taste. <laughs> Everyone with bad taste needs to be called. No, if, and if he had grown up now, like yeah, he would still play the accordion and have a bunch of swords, but he would also be able to talk to you about anime for 16 hours. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, anime fans. I mean, anime is pretty cool. Yeah. Segoy. Some of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the stuff Idi Amin is probably most famous for is, again, cannibalism, witchcraft, and his obsession with Scotland, because that's like the sensational stuff where you can be so like... So he's for sure eight people. We don't know. Okay. That, again, that's one of those... Yeah, we're about to get into that. Okay. Um, so I, it's inarguably true that he loved Scotland. There's a shitload of documented mm-hmm. evidence of that. Yeah, maybe he just was eating some haggis and people thought it was like <laughs> human intestine. Or they just wished it was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, please eat some people. Stop with that shit. <laughs> It is very much up for debate as to whether or not he was really into black magic and cannibalism. Uh, the rumors that he was into magic and eating people started with the Bagandans. Uh, and the Bagandans were the people from South Uganda, and they did not like the people from North Uganda. Um, a lot of these rumors originate from one Bagandan who served in Idi Amin's cabinet. He wrote in his book, 
which was one of the major sources for The Last King of Scotland, quote, Amin's bizarre behavior derives partly from his tribal background. Like many other warrior societies, the Kakwa, Amin's tribe, are known to have practiced blood rituals on slain enemies. These involve cutting a piece of flesh from the body to subdue the dead man's spirit or tasting the victim's blood to render the spirit harmless. Such rituals still exist among the Kakwa. If they kill a man, it is their practice to insert a knife in the body and touch the bloody blade to their lips. I have reason to believe that Amin's practices do not stop at tasting blood. On several occasions, he has boasted to me and others that he has eaten human flesh. He went on to say that eating human flesh is not uncommon in his home area. It's possible that this is true. The British noted that the Kakwa engaged in, quote, sacrifices of humans and animals. But it's also worth noting that most of the claims about cannibalism came from Itty's enemies. A major source for this podcast was an article from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands titled Itty Amin, Icon of Evil. This article notes that the witchcraft and cannibalism myths may have started as a result of local racism within Uganda, so racism from southern Ugandans mm-hmm. towards no- northern Ugandans. Quote, the southern Ugandans are particularly contemptuous of the southern Sudanese and Nubis, not of other northern tribes, as wild and uncivilized. It is from them that we have reports of Amin and his Nubis tasting the blood of their victims and eating their livers, and the explanation that such a custom is either a Nubi or Kakwa one. So we don't know. It's possible he licked blood. It's possible he ate flesh. It's also possible that's just racism from people in the yeah, south. Yeah, I mean, him. I would argue... You know, you kill thousands of people. That is worse anyway. I mean, like, I wouldn't be completely surprised if, you know, he got into desecrating some bodies at all. It wouldn't be beyond the pale to to assume. But Mm -hmm. it's also, I think this is something that happens in Western media a lot with Mm -hmm. these dictators where if you can get, like, there's a bunch of stories about the North Korean regime that are are bullshit, that Mm -hmm. that have no basis in reality, about, like, and it's always, like, the kooky ones about, like, ridiculous claims that Kim's made, and, like, the stuff that that sounds really funny, Mm -hmm. like, that you can laugh at, and some of those are true, because, like, any authoritarian regime is going to have some silly stuff around it, Uh because it's a silly thing, Um, but a lot of it's just lies, and it's the same thing. It's lies that make it seem like something other than what it is, which is a brutal dictatorship, mm-hmm. as opposed to like, no, it's this crazy cannibal madman who ruled a country. And it's like, well, no, there's nothing really crazy. He's just a, a monster like all yeah, of the other That's monsters. less scary to me than just a person who knows exactly what they're doing and does it anyway. That's like uh, if, an, if an oil tycoon or something, and then there was a rumor, they're like, did you hear that he litters? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's ruining the environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I that's kind of why I wanted to dig into these myths about him a lot because mm-hmm. it, that's what most people know about Idi Amin, which I think is less I think the fact that the idea that oh maybe this guy was a cannibal and a dictator is less interesting than like this guy was trained to be a brutal dictator in the British army who raised him to be a soldier and then abandoned him and his country to whatever was mm-hmm. going to happen next, which I think is a more accurate story. Mm-hmm. Um and but that one isn't fun for Americans mm-hmm. because it implicates all of Western civilization, uh, yeah. as opposed to oh, some cannibal gotten in charge over there in Africa. <laughs> um, anyway, that's that's you know my thinking on the matter. Um, so uh, obviously by this time, uh, and you know by the middle of his reign, uh, kind of the bloom was off the rose. The British were no longer fans of Idi Amin. Word of his atrocities had filtered out to the world. Europe turned away, and Idi did what he always did when someone questioned him. He flipped out and attacked. He declared himself conqueror of the British Empire. He had T-shirts printed up with his face on it and conqueror of the British Empire printed beneath, which is a pretty pretty pro move. Uh, he developed a love for having white guys, particularly British guys, bow to him. So there's a bunch of pictures like this of British businessmen, like, I mean, swearing uh, oaths to him. Now, this is the first cool thing that you showed me. <laughs> oh, just wait, because it's about to get fucking better. Uh, because at one point, he made a bunch of British businessmen carry him around on a sedan chair while a crowd cheered. Which okay. is, that's a solid move. Yeah, I do like that. <laughs> it's hard not to support that. For sure. He's got a little, he's got, oh, okay. Someone's holding an umbrella for him. Yeah. Love and, it. and that's the kind of wackiness that we know went down. Mm-hmm. And again, he's not all wrong. Like the whiskey plane was a solid idea. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Edie desperately wanted to be a major player on the global stage. He wasted no opportunity to wade into any global conflict that he could. When the Watergate scandal broke, he sent a letter to Richard Nixon and gave him advice on how to handle oh. Watergate. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Quote, when the stability of a nation is in danger, the only solution is, unfortunately, to imprison the leaders of the opposition. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the longer he was in power, the more unhinged and braggy he became. President Amin started to inflate the stories of his military service, claiming he'd fought in Burma during World War II. He offered to marry Princess Anne of Great Britain. He also offered to become King of Scotland and lead the Scots to independence from Britain. Britain. Mm. Uh, for the most part, the international response to Idi Amin was laughter, the same kind of laughter you'll find today when people talk about ridiculous North Korean propaganda. Alan Corrin, a British comedian, had a popular column in Punch magazine where he'd write out fake Idi Amin speeches that were very racist. Mm. Uh, if you've got Spotify, you can find the album that was made based on these columns with a white guy doing Idi's voice. When and was it this? Is, it was, I mean, this was like in the mid-70s. Oh, okay. Um, if you look up Idi Amin on Spotify, you'll find the album, and it's, like, infuriating. Wow. Because it's just, it's joking about what was in reality a horrific crime-filled regime. Yeah. Making fun of the fact that Idi Amin talks funny, which he doesn't even talk that funny. He's, 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 no. He speaks better English than I do fucking Ugandan. Um, so, uh, yeah, th but this is, again, that's the international reaction, is they're laughing at this guy, they're making fun of him, he's like, th this horror show is playing out in Africa, and it's being treated as kind of like a, a, a freak show to the rest of the world. Um, so, yeah, the caricature of Idi Amin um, is based a lot in white European racism, but it's also based in some local Ugandan regional racism. So their north, north of Uganda, is basically the social equivalent of the American South, and the well-educated, well-to-do southern Ugandans considered Idi Amin to be like a hillbilly. They thought his mm -hmm. accent, his, it, when he spoke in Uganda, they thought his accent was painful. Um, so it's basically, he was like, to a lot of people in southern Uganda, he was like if we had a president who came from the dirty south and talked like he was, he grew up on the body. Yeah, President Kid Rock, number yeah. 46. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That That is the attitude that, like, the yeah. southerners have towards him. Um, in reality, Idi Amin was a pretty smart guy. Uh, he wasn't educated, obviously, but he was, he had a lot of intelligence um, because you don't, carry out a regime like mm -hmm. this and keep it going for eight years without that. Most of his actions were pretty logical. Uh, mass murder is a time-honored way to stay in power. Exiling the Asians tanked Uganda's economy, but it provided Idi with a host of businesses that he could give away to his supporters in exchange for their loyalty. And for a while, his tactics worked pretty well. But he made more mistakes as time went on. Uh, one of those was alienating Israel. He had initially been friendly to the country. He'd trained there, again, as a paratrooper. But he wound up switching around and backing the Palestinian cause, which is fine. But he also descended into horrific anti-Semitism. In 1972, the, he told the UN Secretary General that Hitler had been, quote, right to burn six million Jews. Yikes. And he promised to build a monument to Hitler in Kampala. Uh, he was eventually convinced to cancel this plan because everyone around him was like, that's a fucking bad idea, Eddie Amin. But he continued pissing off Israel as the years rolled by. On June 27th, 1976, an Air France flight with 248 passengers was hijacked by two members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Now, this was back in the day when terrorist plane hijackers didn't kill people, mm -hmm. as a general rule. They just kind of have the plane flown to an airport and hold everyone hostage until their comrades were released from prison or they got a bunch of money or whatever. Okay. This was like a common thing. There was a period of time in the 70s where every week there'd be a new fucking hijacking. Um, so these particular hijackers, and the, this plane, most of the passengers are Israeli. Mm -hmm. So these particular hijackers land first in Libya and then at Entebbe Airport in Uganda. President Amin welcomed them enthusiastically. This proved to be a mistake when one week later, Israeli commandos raided the airport, liberated the captives, and destroyed a sizable chunk of the Ugandan Air Force while it was sitting on the tarmac. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, there's a f movie called Raid on Entebbe about it. It's a very famous, like, commando raid thing. Um, so Idi flipped out of this. Uh, he'd already switched from being pro-Israel to pro-Palestine, of course, uh, but he went over the deep end. He had a 73-year-old Jewish woman in a Ugandan hospital named Dora Block, uh, pretty brutally murdered, and then he went on kind of a world insult tour. Um, so this is kind of a, a little bit, and, and there's growing local resistance to him at this point too. So he's he starts to 
in the late 70s go off the rails a bit. Mm. Uh, he called the president of Tanzania a coward, an old woman, and a prostitute. He called the president of Zambia an imperialist puppet and bootlicker. He called Henry Kissinger a murderer and a spy, which was pretty fair. Uh, he also said that Queen Elizabeth should send him her 25-year-old knickers to celebrate her silver jubilee. So he was like, send me your old underwear, Queen of England. Yeah. Which is... I appreciate fun. a good this. Yeah, that's, that's solid. Uh, he steadily expanded his list of titles over the years. In 1977, he announced that he must now be addressed as, quote, His Excellency, Field Marshal Al-Haji Dr. Idi Amin Dada, Life President of Uganda, Conqueror of the British Empire, Distinguished Service Order of the Military Cross, Victoria Cross, and Professor of Geography. <laughs> what a good tag at the end this guy is funny yeah that, that professor of geography Stupid. thing is really what sets it off <laughs> um on october 30th 1978 Eddie made the biggest mistake of his dictator career he invaded tanzania um this was over a pretty useless piece of land like there was no good reason to attack the spot that he did mm -hmm. tanzania counterattacked, and since their military was much more functional than the ugandan military the ugandans were quickly thrown back next tanzania marched on uganda aided by begandan ugandan exiles they moved to unseat U uh, Idi from power for his part Idi amin announced that he now loved the tanzanian president and quote would have married him if he had been a woman this didn't work uh, mm. and, and did not turn back the Tanzanian army. So Idi Amin had to flee from power, uh, first to Libya and then to Saudi Arabia, where he spent the rest of his life in exile. Uh, somehow not being a warlord anymore seemed to calm him down. He lived a quiet life, regularly visiting Mecca and living with just one wife and several of his children. Boo. Yeah. Yeah, he's one of the ones who got away with it. Ugh. Um, Idi explained in a rare 1993 interview that, quote, when I am no longer president, some of them say they don't want me. I accept it frankly. I have had one wife since and have found also to have one wife is better. So Idi Amin lapsed into a coma on July 19th, 2003. Yay. He was put on life support at a hospital in Jeddah. His family had begged the new Ugandan government to let him return home to die. They were told he'd have to stand trial if he returned. So, I mean, he didn't go back. And on August 16th, 2003, Idi Amin died peacefully in a hospital bed in Saudi Arabia. And that's, unfortunately, not the end of the story or Uganda's problems. Uh-oh. Because President Abote... He's a ghost. <laughs> ghost. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> um, President Abote returned after Idi was ousted. Abote was not outwardly ridiculous. He didn't make crazy claims about the Holocaust or randomly insult foreign leaders. He didn't have a wacky title. What he did do was vastly expand the purges that Idi Amin had begun. While Amin had mostly targeted certain tribe members in the military and government, Abote targeted huge chunks of civilians based on their tribe. He probably killed more people in his second term than died during the entirety of Idi Amin's reign. Jesus. Abote was eventually overthrown by a general named Bazello Olaro Okello, who was violently overthrown by Yoweri Museveni's natural, National Resistance Army in 1986. Museveni is still the president of Uganda today. He had term limits abolished in 2005 and removed the presidential aid limit in 2017. Uganda has, to this day, never seen a peaceful transition of power. Wow. So, that's the story. Oh, that's a heartwarming tale. It is. It is. Uh, and it's a tale where, like, I mean, Idi Amin is the, the organ through which all of this repression and violence was executed, but the real bastard of this is the British Empire, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean I'll trace all the blame back to white people anytime, for sure. Mm -hmm. But, man, I, I really just can't imagine living in a country where so much bloodshed is, like, happening constantly all the time, yeah. politically. Um, yeah, I would move away <laughs> so fast. Well, and that's... Uh, it, it's one of those things that... How are you gonna, but... Yeah, how are you gonna? Yeah. And it's you get all these people in Europe and the United States now because most of the people who like flee parts of Africa are gonna wind up heading to Europe because it's mm -hmm. very it's easier to get there than it is to get to the U.S. And you know, get this like, what is our we, we can't take all, care of all these people. It's like, well, you could steal their shit for two hundred years, mm -hmm. like, and then leave them without because Uganda. There, at no point in prior history, there were like kingdoms and states and whatnot mm -hmm. all over Africa. But there was there'd never been a Uganda. 
Like, mm-hmm. all of these groups of people had never been forced together before the British did that. And if you're going to do you shouldn't do that in the first place, but if you're going to do that, if you're going to force these people into a state, you owe it to them to, like, create a functional state before you leave. Yeah. Which, yeah. It's fucked up. It's real fucked up. <laughs> well, I hope you learned something today. I, I sure did. did. <laughs> <laughs> I somehow left more grim than uh, than I came in. Um, that's the fun of colonialism. But that's okay. I mean, like sometimes you got to know the, the monstrous capabilities of um, what you know what we can do as human beings to prevent it. Yeah. Um, geez, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to take a good lesson out of this other than. Don't be a colonialist and don't take a, a people and train them to be soldiers and nothing else for a century. Yeah. Don't murder. <laughs> don't do that. Um, what are some other things? Don't play bagpipes. Don't play the accordion. Well, that's okay. Let's not attack bagpipes. Don't get bagpipes. into swords. Let's not attack no, bagpipes. No, let's, let's, let's attack. <laughs> the bagpipes aren't the problem here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else to learn. I'll I agree mean, with you about accordions. Yeah, I mean, I I haven't watched um, what's it called, Last King of Scotland. Have you watched it? Yeah, it's I, I don't I didn't enjoy it very much. Is it too? Is it sympathetic or? N- no, it's it it plays into the brutality of it. One thing it does a decent job of is showing you how he might have charmed people early uh-huh. on but i think it leans i guess more into the sensational side of things which okay like and it, eating people and stuff and it yeah and it doesn't it doesn't talk at all about a means past in mm. a meaningful way and that's why i led this by talking about british military policy in their colonies because I, I i don't Good. think you can understand a mean without understanding where he and his people came from yeah i mean that alone is interesting um by itself yeah. as a story I mean, not a not a fun story, but it's definitely not a fun story. But it's an important one, uh, and I I will say, uh, if you are starting a punk band in the near future, the Suicide, Suicide. Revolutionary Jazz Band is a pretty fucking yeah, solid name. Yeah, they honestly sound like a ska band <laughs> <laughs> and look like one. They do look like a ska band. They're all dressed nice. They mm-hmm. got their shirts tucked in. Oh man. I could go for some suicide revolutionary ska music. Yeah. Um, I think the worst part of that story was that he died peacefully. <laughs> that is. It's uh, always a bummer when that happens. Because, like, uh, we're, I think Gaddafi's going to be running shortly before this podcast comes out. Mm-hmm. And that's a story where the monster gets, like, that's what you want to see happen to these guys, is they get dragged out into the street and murdered by their own people, the yeah. people that they fucked over. Yeah, I can think of a couple of people I'd like to see that happen to. Yeah, yeah, whose names we won't give because there are laws against that sort of thing. But no. yeah, there's it's hard not to want certain people dragged out into the street mm-hmm. and at least like, you know, maybe not even killed, just peed on by dozens of people. Well, I guess there's nothing left for us to do but for me to ask you to plug, to plug. Your, plug right. your pluggables. Yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, you could, uh, you know, uh, maybe get some laughs from looking at some videos. <laughs> 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 I don't know how to transition this either. I have some videos on my website, birdyreed.com. You can follow me on Twitter at ao bro bro, um, where I just usually complain about. Um, uh, people getting cast <laughs> in Hollywood and making some jokes and you can see me perform some jokes all around LA and um, you know if you have any more questions I will refer you to this guy because I don't know anything well you know if you like complaining about casting they did just cast a new Idi Amin movie uh, did they? yeah Scarlett Johansson's gonna play him fuck off <laughs> <laughs> you got me <laughs> you got me um, I'm Robert Evans you can find me on Twitter at I write OK, just the two letters there I got a book on Amazon called A Brief History of Vice you can find that on Amazon uh, you can find this podcast at Behind the Bastard com where we will have pictures of the incredible suicide revolutionary jazz band and some other pictures from Amin's reign, as well as uh, links to all the sources for this podcast. I really do recommend reading that uh, University of Groningen article. It's a fascinating analysis of why Idi is seen sort of the way he is today and where he came from. Um, mm. So uh, you can also find us on twitter and instagram social media at, at bastards pod so uh so look us up check us out uh 
This has been Behind the Bastards for the week. I've been Robert Evans. Check back in next Tuesday when we will be talking about someone else who is also terrible.